There's an interesting reference to um, interesting reference to the story of King David and Bathsheba. I don't know if you guys know the story of David, King David and Bathsheba. So King David is the greatest king, right? I mean, he's not as smart as Solomon, but he's this, he's this, uh, you know, in, in, in Jewish law, in, in the Old Testament, he is the epitome of a great king, right? I've got a sculpture of David right there when, as a youth before he becomes king. But uh, David, when he's king, is a pretty lustful guy. I mean, Judaism is not Christianity. And, uh, you know, King David is, is lustful left and right. And at some point, King David observes Bathsheba taking a bath, I get nude, on the roof of her home. Um, it must be adjacent to his. He's king adjacent to the palace somewhere. And um, he lusts after her. And his lusting after her uh, results in him sending her husband to war, to be on the front line, basically in a suicide mission, guaranteeing his death, so he can then take Bathsheba as a mistress. So he commits murder, takes Bathsheba as a mistress. Now, the Christian version, or the purity, purity version of this, the purity culture version of this, is this is all Bathsheba's fault, because she took a bath naked on the roof. And she exposed herself to King David. He couldn't help himself. He couldn't help himself. Right? Now, Judaism has a different interpretation. Judaism is it's like, yeah, he's a king. He's lustful. He's lustful. He does this kind of stuff. And God is pretty upset at him because this is murder. Um, it's pretty upset at him, not so much for the lust. He has no problem with lust. It's, it's, the, it's the murder that he doesn't like. So he actually penalizes David. And David doesn't build the temple because of this. Right? So David is punished. Whereas, um, uh, that's why Solomon brings the, table, uh, the, the temple. Uh, David is punished, primarily for the, for the, for the murder. But Christianity would penalize Bathsheba. I mean, Judaism is so much healthier a religion than, um, than Christianity. And one of the things that makes, one of the things that makes these ultra-Orthodox nutcases nuts is how they distort a religion that is so much more worldly, so much more this-worldly, so much more embracing of things like sex than they would make it out. But in the Hasidic movement, it's the same thing. Women must dress very, very, very modestly. Why? Because not to create lust among men. It tells you something about the men in these places, I think. Can't control themselves. Same with Muslims. So, so I, I, you know, women in the city community won't shake your hand if you're a man. They won't sit on the same sofa with you. They will sit away from you, you know, unless they're your wife. So uh, Judaism is really, really bad. I found this, um, this quote, I thought, really illustrative. Uh, this is from about evangelical culture, this, this purity culture. It says, uh, he says, this kind of culture teaches women to hate their bodies as the source of temptation. And it teaches men to hate their minds, which lead them into lust and sexual immorality. I mean, that is a really good line. I mean, this is the mind-body dichotomy, right? It teaches women to hate their bodies because their bodies are the source of temptation. And it teaches, hate to, it teaches men to hate their minds and their sexual desires. Because they lead them into lust and sexual immorality. Now, what happened to this guy in Atlanta? I am speculating. He was drawn by his sexual desires and maybe by consuming pornography, which it sounds like he had a problem with, into one of these massage parlors where he experienced the 
amazing, right, sexual experience that they can provide. And my guess is that he kept coming, coming in both terms, I guess, and kept visiting these uh, parlors, probably several of them. That's why he didn't just shoot up one. He shot up many. And he kept going back to his evangelical life and trying to atone for his sins. It's like St. Augustine whipping himself in order to suppress his sexual desi desires. Or Augustine rolling around in the snow to suppress his sexual desires. Well, this guy went to all kind of, I don't know, uh, uh, treatment centers, evangelical treatment centers, where they do the equivalent, I guess, of whipping yourself in order to suppress your desires. And it didn't help. He kept being drawn to these things, to these massage parlors. He kept being drawn to the pleasure, kept being drawn to the sex, kept experiencing the lust and the desire, kept pulling him there. And he was addicted to pleasure, a particular type of pleasure. I mean, wow, how evil is that? But no, that his religion prohibits him from experiencing sex with somebody he might like, somebody he might be dating, that is immoral. That is wrong. So he must basically go to sex workers in order to experience this. And of course, what lures him in there are those darn women. Women who, you know, and this is, who have no problem with sex. Who flaunt their sexuality who advertise their sexuality. And nothing is more horrific, according to this theology, than women who flaunt their sexuality, women who lure you in, the seductresses. There's nothing more evil than that. So it's their responsibility. It's their fault. Women are supposed to be responsible for the morality of men. Women are supposed to be responsible to keep these men in line. And yet here they're doing the opposite. They're seducing him into immorality. And you can see that somebody weak, somebody sick, somebody completely nuts could take that to the point of, well, the only way to get rid of this sins that I'm committing is to commit a much bigger sin of murdering them. How do you rationalize that one? I don't know. But that's where he's a little nuts. But think about the unhappiness that this brings millions of people. Women who believe that their bodies are evil because they're the source of temptation. Men who believe that their sexual desires are evil, that their minds are evil. It is truly, truly disgusting. Truly disgusting. That this is still being taught, that this is still being preached, this is still being believed in the 21st century. And of course now these communities have to deal with the fact that pornography is so prevalent. Uh, you know, preachers are uh, encouraging people to get to give up their phones, give up an internet connection just so they're not exposed to pornography. And I'm sure there's a lot of pornograph there's addiction to pornography in these communities because they can't express their sexuality health in a healthy way. And they're not going to be happy in marriage either. They know nothing about sex. They're suspicious of sex. There's a lot of infidelity that goes around, adultery that goes around because men can't help it. There's a story about a woman who, um, whose husband cheated on her, but he explained it as this other woman was wearing very sexy clothes and I couldn't help myself. So, uh, uh, you know, the priest and him convinced his wife not only to forgive him, but also to burn all her sexy clothes so that it wouldn't happen to her, that she wouldn't seduce some husband of some other woman 
because she was wearing clothes that were too sexy. I mean, this is medieval thinking, which is understandable among ultra-Orthodox Jews or Muslims, but is unforgivable, unforgivable among 21st century individuals. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share and uh, you can support the show at youronbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if, you, even if you just come here to troll or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified, right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.